Chapter Six of Eight Pillars of Prosperity by James Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Chapter Six, Fifth Pillar, Sympathy. The remaining pillars are the four central pillars in the Temple of Prosperity. They give it greater strength and stability, and add both to its beauty and utility. They contribute greatly to its attractiveness for they belong to the highest moral sphere, and therefore to great beauty and nobility of character. They indeed make a man great, and place him among the comparatively few whose minds are rare, and that shine apart in sparkling purity and bright intelligence. Sympathy should not be confounded with that maudlin and superficial sentiment, which, like a pretty flower without root, presently perishes, and leaves behind neither seed nor fruit. To fall into hysterics about some suffering abroad is not sympathy. Neither are bursts of violent indignation against the cruelties and injustices of others any indication of a sympathetic mind. If one is cruel at home, if he badgers his wife, or beats his children, or abuses his servants, or stabs his neighbors with shafts of bitter sarcasm, what hypocrisy is his profession of love? for the suffering people who are outside the immediate range of his influence. What shallow sentiment informs his bursts of indignation against the injustice and hard-heartedness in the world around him? Says Emerson of such, Go love thy infant, love thy woodchopper, be good-natured and modest, have that grace, and never varnish your hard, uncharitable ambition with this incredible tenderness for black folk a thousand miles off, thy love afar is spite at home. The test of a man is in his immediate acts, not in ultra-sentiments, and if those acts are consistently informed with selfishness and bitterness, if those at home hear his steps with dread, and feel a joyful relief on his departure, how empty are his expressions of sympathy for the suffering or downtrodden, how futile his membership of a philanthropic society though the well of sympathy may feed the spring of tears that spring more often draws its supply from the dark pool of selfishness for when selfishness is thwarted it spends itself in tears sympathy is a deep silent inexpressible tenderness which is shown in a consistently self-forgetful gentle character sympathetic people are not gushing and spasmodic but are permanently self-restrained, firm, quiet, unassuming and gracious. Their undisturbed demure, where the suffering of others is concerned, is frequently mistaken for indifference by shallow minds. But the sympathetic and discerning eye recognizes, in their quiet strength, and their swiftness to aid while others are weeping and wringing their hands, the deepest, soundest sympathy lack of sympathy is shown in cynicism ill-natured sarcasm bitter ridicule taunting and mockery and anger and condemnation as well as in that morbid and false sentiment which is a theoretical and assumed sympathy having no basis in practice lack of sympathy arises in egotism sympathy arises in love egotism is involved in ignorance love is allied to knowledge it is common with men to imagine themselves as separate from their fellows with separate aims and interests and to regard themselves as right and others wrong in their respective ways sympathy lifts a man above this separate and self-centered life and enables him to live in the hearts of his fellows and to think and feel with them he puts himself in their place and becomes for the time being as they are as Whitman, the hospital hero, expresses it. I do not ask the wounded person. It is a kind of impertinence to question a suffering creature. Suffering calls for aid and tenderness, not for curiosity, and the sympathetic man or woman feels the suffering and ministers to its alleviation. Nor can sympathy boast, and wherever self-praise enters in, sympathy passes out. If one speaks of his many deeds of kindness, and complains of the ill-treatment he has received in return, he has not done kindly deeds, 
but has yet to reach that self-forgetful modesty which is the sweetness of sympathy sympathy in its real and profound sense is oneness with others in their strivings and sufferings so that the man of sympathy is a composite being he is as it were a number of men and he views a thing from a number of different sides and not from one side only and that his own particular side he sees with other men's eyes hears with their ears thinks with their minds and feels with their hearts he is thus able to understand men who are vastly different from himself the meaning of their lives is revealed to him and he is united to them in the spirit of good will said balzac the poor fascinate me their hunger is my hunger i am with them in their homes their privations i suffer i feel the beggar's rags upon my back i for the time become the poor and despised man it reminds us of the saying of one greater than balzac that a deed done for a suffering little one was done for him and so it is sympathy leads us to the hearts of all men so that we become spiritually united to them and when they suffer we feel the pain when they are glad we rejoice with them when they are despised and persecuted we spiritually descend with them into the depths and take into our hearts their humiliation and distress and he who has this binding uniting spirit of sympathy can never be cynical and condemnatory can never pass thoughtless and cruel judgments upon his fellows because in his tenderness of heart he is ever with them in their pain but to have reached this ripened sympathy it must be that one has loved much suffered much and sounded the dark depths of sorrow it springs from acquaintance with the profoundest experiences so that a man has had conceit thoughtlessness and selfishness burnt out of his heart no man can have true sympathy who has not been in some measure at least a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief but the sorrow and grief must have passed must have ripened into a fixed kindness and habitual calm to have suffered so much in a certain direction that suffering is finished and only its particular wisdom remains enables one wherever that suffering presents itself to understand and deal with it by pure sympathy and when one has been perfected by suffering in many directions he becomes a center of rest and healing for the sorrowing and broken-hearted who are afflicted with the afflictions which he has experienced and conquered as a mother feels the anguish of her suffering child so the man of sympathy feels the anguish of suffering men such is the highest and holiest sympathy but a sympathy much less perfect is a great power for good in human life and a measure of it everywhere and every day is needed while rejoicing in the fact that in every walk of life there are truly sympathetic people one also perceives that harshness resentment and cruelty that are all too common these hard qualities bring their own sufferings and there are those who fail in their business or particular work entirely because of the harshness of their disposition a man who is fiery and resentful or who is hard cold and calculating with the springs of sympathy dried up within him even though he be otherwise an able man will in the end scarcely avoid disaster in his affairs his heated folly in the one case or cold cruelty in the other will gradually isolate him from his fellows and from those who are immediately related to him in his particular avocation so that the elements of prosperity will be eliminated from his life leaving him with a lonely failure and perhaps a hopeless despair even in ordinary business transactions sympathy is an important factor for people will always be attracted to those who are of a kindly and genial nature preferring to deal with them rather than with those who are hard and forbidding in all spheres where direct personal contact plays an important part the sympathetic man with average ability will always take precedence of the man of greater ability but who is unsympathetic if a man be a minister of clergymen a cruel laugh or an unkind sentence from him 
will seriously injure his reputation and influence but particularly his influence for even they who admire his good qualities will through his unkindness unconsciously have a lower regard for him in their personal esteem if a business man professes religion people will expect to see the good influence of that religion on his business transactions to profess to be a worshipper of the gentle jesus on sunday and all the rest of the week be a hard grasping worshipper of mammon will injure his trade and detract considerably from his prosperity sympathy is a universal spiritual language which all even the animals instinctively understand and appreciate for all beings and creatures are subject to suffering and this sameness of painful experience leads to that unity of feeling which we call sympathy selfishness impels men to protect themselves at the expense of others but sympathy impels them to protect others by the sacrifice of self and in this sacrifice of self there is no real and ultimate loss for while the pleasure of selfishness are small and few the blessings of sympathy are great and manifold it can be asked how can a business man whose object is to develop his own trade practice self-sacrifice every man can practice self-sacrifice just where he is and in the measure that he is capable of understanding it if one contends that he cannot practice a virtue for were his circumstances different he would still have the same excuse diligence in business is not incompatible with self-sacrifice for devotion to duty even though that duty be trade is not selfishness but may be an unselfish devotion i know a businessman who when a competitor who had tried to cut him out of business cut himself out and failed set that same competitor up in business again truly a beautiful act of self-sacrifice and the man that did it is today one of the most successful and prosperous of businessmen the most prosperous commercial traveller i have ever known was overflowing with exuberant kindness and geniality he was as innocent of all tricks of trade as a newborn infant but his great heart and manly uprightness won for him fast friends wherever he went men were glad to see him come into their office or shop or mill and not alone for the good embracing influence he brought with him but also because his business was sound and trustworthy this man was successful through sheer sympathy but sympathy so pure and free from policy that he himself would probably have denied that his success could be attributed to it sympathy can never hinder success it is selfishness that blights and destroys as good will increases man's prosperity will increase all interests are mutual and stand or fall together and as sympathy expands the heart it extends the circle of influence making blessings both spiritual and material to more greatly abound fourfold are the qualities which make up the great virtue of sympathy namely one kindness two generosity three gentleness four insight kindness when fully developed is not a passing impulse but a permanent quality an intermittent and unreliable impulse is not kindness though it often goes under that name there is no kindness in praise if it be followed by abuse the love which seems to prompt the spontaneous kiss will be of little account if it be associated with a spontaneous spite the gift which seems so gracious will lose its value should the giver afterwards wish its value in return to have one's feelings aroused to do a kind action toward another by some external stimulus pleasing to oneself and shortly afterwards to be swayed to the other extreme towards the same person by an external event unpleasing to oneself should be regarded as weakness of character it is also a selfish condition to be thinking of oneself only a true kindness is unchangeable and needs no external stimulus to force it into action it is a well from which thirsty souls can always drink and it never runs dry kindness when it is a strong virtue 
is bestowed not only on those who please us but also upon those whose actions go contrary to our wish and will and is a constant and never varying glow of genial warmth there are some actions of which men repent such are all unkind actions there are other actions of which men do not repent and such are all kind actions the day comes when men are sorry for the cruel things they said and did but the day of gladness is always with them for the kindly things they have said and done unkindness mars a man's character it mars his face as time goes on and it mars that perfection of success which he would otherwise reach kindness beautifies the character it beautifies the face with the growth of years and it enables a man to reach that perfection of success to which his intellectual abilities entitle him a man's prosperity is mellowed and enriched by the kindness of his disposition generosity goes with a larger-hearted kindness if kindness be the gentle sister generosity is the strong brother a free open-handed and magnanimous character is always attractive and influential stinginess and meanness always repel they are dark cramped narrow and cold kindness and generosity always attract they are sunny genial open and warm that which repels makes for isolation and failure that which attracts makes for union and success giving is as important a duty as getting and he who gets all he can and refuses to give will at last be unable to get for it is as much a spiritual law that we cannot get unless we give as that we cannot give unless we get giving has always been taught as a great and important duty by all religious teachers this is because giving is one of the highways of personal growth and progress it is a means by which we attain to greater and greater unselfishness and by which we prevent the falling back into selfishness it implies that we recognize our spiritual and social kinship with our fellow men and are willing to part with a position of that which we have earned or possess for a man who the more he gets hungers for more still and refuses to loosen his grasp upon his accumulating store like a wild beast with its prey is retrogressing he is shutting himself out from all the higher joy-giving qualities and from free and life-giving communion with unselfish happy human hearts dickinson's scrooge in a christmas carol represents the condition of such a man with graphic vividness and dramatic force our public men in england today probably also in america are nearly all i think i might say all for i have not yet met an exception great givers these men lord mayors mayors magistrates town and city councillors and all men fulfilling responsible public offices being men who have been singularly successful in the management of their own private affairs are considered the best men for the management of public affairs and numerous noble institutions throughout the land are perpetual witnesses to the munificence of their gifts nor have i been able to find any substantial truth in accusation so often hurled against such men by the envious and unsuccessful that their riches are made unjustly without being perfect men they are an honorable class of manly vigorous generous and successful men who have acquired riches and honor by sheer industry ability and uprightness let a man beware of greed of meanness of envy of jealousy of suspicion for these things if harbored will rob him of all that is best in life even all that is best in material things as well as all that is best in character and happiness let him be liberal of heart and generous of hand magnanimous and trusting not only giving cheerfully and often of his substance but allowing his friends and fellow men freedom of thought and action let him be thus and honor plenty and prosperity will come knocking at the door for admittance as his friends and guests gentleness is akin to divinity 
perhaps no quality is so far removed from all that is coarse brutal and selfish as gentleness so that when one is becoming gentle he is becoming divine it can only be acquired after much experience and through great self-discipline it only becomes established in a man's heart when he has controlled and brought into subjection his animal voice a distinct firm but quiet enunciation and freedom from excitement vehemence or resentment in particularly aggravating circumstances if there is one quality which above all others should distinguish the religious man it is the quality of gentleness for it is the hallmark of spiritual culture the rudely aggressive man is an affront to cultivated minds and unselfish hearts our word gentleman has not altogether departed from its original meaning it is still applied to one who is modest and self-restrained who is considerate for the feelings and welfare of others a gentle man whose good behavior is prompted by thoughtfulness and kindliness is always loved whatever may be his origin quarrelsome people make a display in their bickering and recriminations of their ignorance and lack of culture the man who has perfected himself in gentleness never quarrels he never returns the hard word he leaves it alone or meets it with a gentle word which is far more powerful than wrath gentleness is wedded to wisdom and the wise man has overcome all anger in himself and so understands how to overcome it in others the gentleman is saved from most of the disturbances and turmoils with which uncontrolled men afflict themselves while they are wearing themselves out with wasteful and needless strain he is quiet and composed and such quietness and composure are strong to win in the battle of life insight is the gift of sympathy the sympathetic mind is the profoundly perceiving mind we understand by experience and not by argument before we can know a thing or being our life must touch its or his life argument analyzes the outer skin but sympathy reaches to the heart the cynic sees the hat and coat and thinks he sees the man the sympathetic seer sees the man and is not concerned with the hat and coat in all kinds of hatred there is a separation by which each misjudges the other in all kinds of love there is a mystic union by which each knows the other sympathy being the purest form of this the greatest poet because he has the largest heart no other figure in all literature has shown such a profound knowledge of the human heart and of nature both animate and inanimate the personal shakespeare is not to be found in his works he is merged by sympathy into his characters the wise man and the philosopher the madman and the fool the drunkard and the harlot these he for the time into their particular experiences knew them better than they knew themselves shakespeare has no partiality no prejudice his sympathy embraces all from the lowest to the highest prejudice is the great barrier to sympathy and knowledge it is impossible to understand those against whom one harbors a prejudice we only see men and things as they are when we divest our minds of partial judgments we become seers as we become sympathizers sympathy has knowledge for her companion inseparable are the feeling heart and the seeing eye the man of pity is the man of prophecy he whose heart beats in tune with all hearts to him the contents of all hearts are revealed nor are past and future any longer insoluble mysteries to the man of sympathy his moral insight apprehends the perfect round of human life sympathetic insight lifts a man into the consciousness of freedom gladness and power his spirit inhales joy as his lungs inhale air there are no longer any fears of his fellow men of competition hard times enemies and the like these groveling illusions have disappeared and there has opened up before his awakened vision a realm of greatness and grandeur end of chapter 6 recording by andrea fiori